This day is the seventh day of April, 1964. I am recording a song that was uh, sung for small children when they were at an age where they were beginning to talk and understand. This little song is about a buffalo calf wanting to nurse and the mother telling it to wait until they get to a certain place before she would uh, nurse her baby. The little calf in this song says, Mother, let me nurse. And the mother answers, You will nurse at the Antler Hill. That's where we are going. This next song is a song that was a favorite of my grandfather, Wichita Blaine. This is the song uh, lullaby that his grandmother uh, often sang to him. And I heard him say a lot of times that when he would think of his grandmother, well, I used to hear him sing this song once in a while, uh, sometimes in the evening. And uh, my grandmother, used to sing it to me, and which uh, really is the ones, the women are the ones that should sing, but a lot of times uh, a man will sing to his uh, grandchild or, grand or great-grandchildren, if they're lucky to have great-grandchildren, and children. The words are ha adiyu, which means look, the calf. Ha meaning look, adiyu meaning calf, a bison calf. When you are singing the song, you say ha radi, ha indicating meaning look, ra indicating the subject, ri in, is the subject, the calf. This lullaby I used to hear my grandmother Effie Blaine sing and it, the words say look at the young baby animals coming.
I want to explain a word meaning waiting. This word is a pony word meaning pertaining to waiting. Uh, you say ruhrudi. Ruhrudi means to wait. Duhrudi means that person is waiting on you. Datuhrudi means I am waiting on you. Deskuhrudi means you are waiting on me. Now, this song that I will sing has this word in there, Radudi. Radudi means a waiter, someone who waits. And, uh, you know, there are times when the, a girl will give birth to a child. And while the child uh, immediately after the child is born, there are times when another one is conceived. So, before the other child is weaned properly, another one is on the way. Now, the old Indians say that uh, that causes the first child to cry a lot. So, <clears throat> usually when a small baby is crying quite a bit, they call him a waiter. He is waiting on the second child. That's why they say, Karu Raduri, is he a waiter? And uh, they say that uh, they cry a lot because they feel that they are missing the proper attention that it would have got. Uh, however, that may be true. So this song has that word in there, Raduri. This is a lullaby that has that word Raduri in there. And uh, it's a lullaby and uh, usually they they bring that word in there pertaining to a waiter and it also uh, it's a small it's a name for a small child not a name but it's something that they do call it and uh, when the person picks up a little baby and starts humming this little tune well that's what they're calling it just like it's saying oh you poor little darling waiter <laughs> October 1964. We are here at Stillwater, Oklahoma. Noah, Jimmy, 
This means hello, Jimmy. It went thought the chick stay who the talk who did. It means I feel well when I see you. It said it beat at this. It is apparent that you are growing into a man, that you are becoming into manhood. I thought the chick stay who. You are about and dancing this war dance, and I feel well about that. This is what the old people say. Always try to be a part of something. Means to be about this, whatever you pursue. Be about it good. Hey, did do it. Aku da kudu. Ari skara chikstit da kuwari. If you do these things, it will seem that you are by yourself. By that, they mean that you will be outstanding. If you mind your own business and it will, you will just stand out in your manner to the eyes of the people. That's that's what this means. And this is part of it. To be living good. Uh, that means uh, to try to use discretion and not be apparently getting into trouble and trying to be by yourself and not to be rowdy and uh, uh, all the little things that go to make up a bad character. These things, if you leave them alone, that's what that's what they mean when they say we, you will look outstanding. means this there is a God above and that's who you call out to and it is it is true is it if you pray to God and if you are sincere, the things that you ask for will be given to you. He arawaku. Six kawidi isut pak isut iskutik sa wats pakararu. He kustet. He said that even if you think a prayer, a good prayer, that he will hear. Rawa atira means hello mother. Rawa atias means hello father. Rawa pido means hello son. Rawa tiwatsirix means hello uncle. And if you're at the table and you say, Kait kesiradu means bring me the salt or pass me the salt. If you say katskapit kesiradu means pass me the pepper. Kisatski means meat. It's a tau means bread. Atit means beans. Atikitskusu means green beans. Rikisu means corn off the cob. Reksu means corn on the cob. Rakaraki plate. Retsiki knife. Sistatsara. 
fork. I am Garland Blaine, a Pawnee. This is the 30th of December, 1964. I am going to relate the proceedings of a funeral. Uh, the Pawnee's uh, observance. This is, this used to be the way that uh, funerals were conducted in the past. Back when the Pawnees lived in Nebraska, there were times <coughs> when a person passed away the, f the funeral was conducted in this manner. Whenever a person passed away, the village got all quiet. The children were told to be quiet. Any activity was halted, and everybody was still. The in respect to the people in sorrow. At that time, the funeral was held uh, almost immediately. If a person died in the morning, they would uh, dress the body and uh, relatives would come and mourn and people, friends would come and view the body. And in the evening, they would bury the person. Now, if the person died in the afternoon or late in the evening, they would probably keep them overnight and possibly keep them over all day the next day and then bury them in the evening. Now, that is when they were in their home village, in the permanent villages. Now, if they were on a hunting expedition and on the move, and a person died, they would quickly dress him and then lay him away. At that time, the Pawnees buried them as people are buried in this day and time, laying down laid out straight, head to the west. And after a person was uh, dressed, a man was chosen to come and preside over the uh, funeral. In most cases, uh, a chief would come and uh, talk to the kinfolks, relatives, and friends. And that was quite an honor because the chief, uh, being a man in a high position with a lot of responsibility, to take time to let everything else go and come to this family, which was really his obligation anyway. <clears throat> However, it was understood that since the safety of the tribe depended on the chief's decisions, and since the welfare of the tribe de depended on his decisions, well, most of the people uh, didn't look for the chief to come and uh, preside. <clears throat> However, in most instances, he did. And there was procedures and rules to follow, which uh, were handed down from a long time in the past. There was observances, uh, language, uh, a certain amount of, uh, of elaborate... Uh, uh, procedures to, to follow, uh, such as um, 
walking in certain directions, uh, uh, facing certain directions, and things that went into uh, a proper procedure in presiding over a funeral. Now, after the person was uh, laid to rest, a few days later, the chief or some man highly respected in the tribe would then prepare, would then have food prepared and would uh, go to these people and ask them, or rather sent a man to these mourners and ask them to come to his dwelling. And when they would arrive, he would tell them that uh, there was food prepared and that he was humbling himself to ask the mourners if they would sit down and eat this food which he had prepared so that people could uh, look forward to brighter times uh, in the language they would uh, it was said as of this I have called you and I want you to sit down and I want you to think think of our tribe think of our people and we know that whenever you lose a loved one, a relative, that uh, it is hard and that there's a lot of sorrow in it. But we want you to look forward. This person has gone to God. And we, those of us that are living, we're the ones that should be mourned because the rest of our lives we will see hard times. We will see all the sorrow that we can feel here while we are still living here on earth. On earth here is the bad place. In this life here on this earth, which we call the bad place. There is sorrow, there is some gladness, there is hurt, there is disappointments, and all things that make life hard. You will constantly look for food. You will constantly try to make your living easier. <clears throat> for your family. And in doing so, you will and come in contact with weather elements, cold, severe cold, heat, severe heat, and those things would you will have to contend with when you are hunting when you are being hunted by the enemy, when you are fighting the enemy. And as a result, well, when a person dies, these things he does not have to face anymore. He is then with the Almighty. And we are the ones that are to be mourned. But when we lose a loved one, we, do, we are mourning the loved one. And it may be because that we do not understand death because God did not want us to understand death, so he did not reveal that part of it to us. Now, the person or the one of the men of the house of the mourners would then stand up, or not necessarily stand up, but then he would uh, answer 
with uh, something like this. I am very grateful and humble that you have prepared this food. Just as you have said, when, when, you have, when you went to get this food, it may have been that, that it was cold. It may have been that it was hot. It may have been that it was hard to get. But you got this food and you had it prepared for keeping. Now, you find me in sorrow and you have prepared this food to feed me. So, in this way you are taking, you are wiping the tears off of my face, of me and my family, and those of us that are mourning. And you are trying to give us symbolically uh, life. When we eat this food, this is life that you are giving us. Now, we will, we will stop crying, and we want to hear noises in the village again. We want to hear singing. We want to hear the laughter of little children, which is the people of tomorrow. And we do not want to hand, we do not want to make it any harder by certain limitations on these little folks. We want to hear the running of little feet. We want to hear the shrill laughter of the little children. We want to hear the old men and the old ladies talking to the little children. We want to hear their songs because these songs and these stories that they're going to tell the little children is something that they must hear so that in turn they may get a little knowledge from these people that have lived for so long which they in turn are trying to give what good knowledge they have received during their lifetime to these little children. So we will eat this food and we will stop mourning and however we will our heart will still be heavy but the image that is in our mind of this loved one will gradually fade away and after a while maybe when we think of them it will be just pleasant memories of things that used to be because one day we are going to follow in their footsteps and we will see them and we will be back with them. And it, in our belief, on the last day when God comes back, of all, with all those that who have gone, will be united with all those that are living at that time. And we will all see each other again. So... I accept, me and mine, we accept, we accept so that what has been taken away from us, the older people tell us that God will give us back, will show us what he has taken away from us, he will show us more and more the good that to replace the sorrow. Now, this used to be the procedure that they followed. The, what I have just related was uh, usually what was said, not word for word, but I am trying to give you uh, a little light on the way the people talked at that time. <laughs> Then the people, there was not very much talking. There was not very much talking because this was a house of sorrow trying to come into gladness. 
So the less talking, uh, the quicker this would uh, take place and come to pass. Now, I'm trying to relate these things the way that they used to be in the past. Now, when I say the past, I am referring back to when the people lived in Nebraska, the Pawnees. Now, if the person that had passed away, if he had any clothing that was good, or a horse, or worldly possessions, <clears throat> these things then would be given to people that were close friends of his, or to people that could uh, uh, certainly make use of them. Now, when I say could certainly make use of them, I mean to a person that uh, if there was a buffalo robe that was good, it could be given to a person that maybe could not get a buffalo robe. It would not be given to a, a great warrior that could get out here and a, or a great hunter that could get out here and acquire his own. It would be given to a person that was maybe past that age where he was active enough to go hunting and acquire uh, his own wearing apparel. If he had a horse, it would be given to a person that was a good friend of his and because a person that was a good friend of his knew the thinking of the of the departed one and a man owning a horse certainly would love a horse and being a friend of his he would take care of this horse just like the or, uh, original owner now Moxons, uh, buckskin leggings, uh, shirts, buckskin jackets. Well, these things then would be given to people that uh, could use them and appreciate them. And there was not a, a big elaborate giveaway. The only things that were given away was the man's immediate possessions, those things that were the possessions that belonged to him. Uh, this is the way the funerals were conducted in Nebraska. In this day and age, since the Pawnees moved to their reservation on near Pawnee, Oklahoma, the funerals have been conducted uh, in a different manner. In this day and age, we have funeral homes, and these funeral homes uh, conduct the funerals. As a result, they, the body lays in the funeral home two days, three days, sometimes four days. And during that time, the people come and view the body and uh, the family is there. And uh, when they go to bury them, well, they... Uh, they are all riding automobiles, and they take the body over to the graveyard. There's the grave dug is the grave is dug in the allotted place, and the body is laid to rest. Then, in this day and age, this is the way the rest of the proceedings are observed. The family themselves usually buy meat and food and then they get somebody to prepare it and they in turn 
feed uh, anybody that comes and wants to eat. And they buy goods, dress materials, blankets, spreads, uh, bedding, uh, and these things they give away to people that uh, are friends or to somebody that uh, came and sat up with a body uh, maybe one or two nights and uh, uh, there's sometimes uh, money given out to people and uh, of course, everybody uh, and puts their good clothes on and they go to these funerals and there's a whole bunch of handshaking and uh, a lot of talking whenever they're at the morning feast will seem like uh, everybody uh, has to get up and uh, talk a little bit, uh, express their condolences to the family in mourning, and most of these, most of the observances in this day and time is exactly just the opposite of the proceedings that what was observed in the past. One thing I forgot to mention a while ago, that in the past, when these people went to the funeral, they did not go in their best dress. They went uh, moderately dressed. And... Uh, they did. They went there and they sat down with the family and expressed their condolences in a short, brief uh, way. Uh, in this day and time, well, there's a lot of talking, uh, just like I said, everybody has different ways to express themselves and they seem to think that this is a good time to do it and they get up and it seems to me like it's more or less a place to be seen and heard. Now, understand this. Personally, I am not knocking it. Don't get the idea that I don't like it because it may be all right. But I am just bringing this out to show a contrast and comparison. Now, uh, however, now in the things that I have said, I may not have used a, a good choice of words, so uh, I want to make it clear here that these, the way I have expressed this is purely to show the differences that used to be and the proceedings that they are observed that they observe in this this time yesterday december the 29th 1964 a cousin of mine jimmy taylor was buried at pawnee oklahoma jimmy taylor i was related to him on my mother's side. My mother and Jimmy's mother, Libertori, were first cousins. The funeral was held at Pawnee, Oklahoma, at the Poteet Funeral Home, and there were a lot of people there. Two church groups from Oklahoma City uh, came there, uh, one a Methodist group and another a Baptist group. And they arrived, and uh, during the funeral, 
they sang uh, Indian church songs and white church songs. There were four preachers there. One preacher flew in from Abilene, Texas, by way of Tulsa. And Ralph Torty, the brother of, half brother of uh, Jimmy, drove to Tulsa and picked up uh, Reverend Bailey. Reverend Bailey was the former chaplain of James Taylor when he was in the Navy uh, serving in Korea. Uh, it was later learned that Jimmy had two Purple Hearts and had received the uh, Navy Cross. Uh, Mr. Uh, Reverend uh, Bailey uh, took charge of the funeral and he gave a very, very touching talk. Uh, Spencer Appetone from Oklahoma City, a Kiowa, uh, also preached, and he gave a very, very impressive, touching talk. Uh, when I first arrived, I looked for Libby, and when I saw her, I went on over and sat down by her, and she was glad to see me, and uh, she broke down and wept, and her sister from Parker, Arizona was there, uh, Stella. And uh, there were, this one room was all filled with uh, kinfolks. Uh, we Indians uh, consider close relations if we are from the bloodline. It doesn't make any difference whether you're sixth or seventh cousin. You are still from the bloodline and you are very, very closely related. Uh, there was also another room there that was full of uh, uh, kinfolks and another room. Well, the prayer, the services got underway, and everything was going along all right, and uh, suddenly uh, Mr. Poteet come in and said, uh, if you people will come with me, well, we will start on in through to view the body. Well, we got up and got behind one another, and he led us up to the front, <coughs> and we viewed the body. And I went immediately right on over to where Libby was sitting. She was sitting with my brother, Ben Peters. Uh, Libby is the mother of the deceased, and uh, I stood in front of her, reached down and took her hands, and I spoke in Indian. I said, uh, Sister, it is something that we do not understand, this death that God uh, put here on earth that we must all go through. But you also have other boys, men. So you are losing one son, but you still have other sons. And you know that we Indians say that when God has taken something away from you, he will give you many fold. The sorrow that he has caused you, he will cause that much more gladness in, in time. And I said that we are the ones here that are living. We are the ones that should be 
mourn for because we are the ones to see all the coming hard times for the rest for the remainder of our days we will all know sorrow we will all know bitterness we will all know hurt still on the other hand we also will know gladness and things uh, that uh, go to uh, make people happy now during in some of these times when we are that we, it may be easily mistaken the things that we think are making us glad they may really be uh, causing us sorrow if we do not look at these problems squarely and I told her that that there was only one place to look and that was to God look to God and accept and believe the things we do not understand leave them to God and in time maybe he will make us understand now I will say this in Pawnee I took Libby by the hands and I said uh, not just to her I said in a voice uh, audible enough to be heard uh, by all those about me I said Heru itahri Tira saakari kirjuvetta suhreet siis sa kuraatsiks ka paakis Ir vetta suhreet siis sa kuraata rahkis Ta u heket siid ihva kiahu saariks pakuht Tita kuruuri heeti raa kitevu ja tees tita kuare kitevu Duuri heera kure vaataari, duuri heera kui vakara aravu Viti vaaku ja tees tita kuare kitevu Is kuud pakara aruhu he is si vaktiks, ir e kuusetse kus tee vakura. Now we tsu it tahri. Now we tsu it it tahri. Is se kuusit skabi hurats. Kuusesaku he ratik skaba. A ratik skapa kisari. Now we hedi wakia. Where do where do the hurits put it? Hey, is it scar a cookie cut? No, we hate it, hate it, a good dog. I'll get two dots, I'll get two dots, it's covered it. It's heavy In my opinion, there were over, well over 500 people there at the funeral. And the procession of cars. I would imagine, in my opinion, there were anywhere from 50 to 75 cars. And when the cars arrived at the fun uh, graveyard uh, north of Pawnee uh, at this, uh, I think it's Highland Cemetery. I, I really don't know. But anyway, it's... Uh, Cemetery at Pawnee, north of Pawnee. Uh, that's where the interment was. And uh, I arrived a little late, and uh, I didn't get up too close to to hear what all went on. So uh, there was, in the distance, uh, I could hear uh, some singing and uh, a little... Uh, message brought again uh, graveyard services I think they called them and uh, pretty soon the people dispersed and I waited around uh, till everybody left and there were only the uh, two men left that was uh, uh, gonna get 
the cover the grave and uh, take down the uh, canvases. And uh, as I started to leave, well, I looked around and I saw uh, Riley uh, Taylor, the younger brother of uh, the deceased. And he was standing over by the grave and he was uh, taking it rather hard. So I went over there and I laid my hand on his shoulder and I said, Riley, I says, we all face these things sometime or other. I said, then you must learn how to accept and uh, in learning how to accept, you will live with it. And in learning how to live with it, it will not be such a burden. I says, and if you cry, well, cry it out. It's the best thing. Don't try to hold back because there will be uh, a certain amount of uh, uneasiness that will stay with you and emotions will weld up in you and uh, uh, it, it'll be rather hard on you. And I told him that uh, that people uh, sometimes uh, really didn't know uh, how what reactions they may take and what reactions may occur. I said there's a certain amount of strain and the fella just isn't quite thinking right and uh, or clearly. I said then say whatever is in your heart and cry it all out. And he he did. And uh, when he got through, uh, he during that time, uh, he grabbed my hand and he just hung on to me and he really let her go. And uh, when he got through crying, well, he looked up and he seemed a lot relieved. And he told me that he was certainly glad that I was there that to said something. He said, I guess that's all it just took, just somebody to say something to me. And he said, I'm glad that it was you. And his wife come up to me after we drove to town to get his car. And while he went to get the car, well, his wife come over and she said, I sure do thank you for being there. And says, you know, there really has never been a man that talked to Riley and uh, being uh, not having a father. And he, she said that just what he needed is somebody older than he, somebody that he respected to come and lay a gentle hand on his shoulder and say a few kind words. And uh, the, in his condition, uh, most any man would have probably got the same results. And so we drove to town picked up his car and they said that the peyote group was uh, giving the morning feast for the family at the women's building at the fairgrounds so we went down there and uh, it was already in procedure and I stood outside and there was a lot of talking going on uh, different people were getting up expressing their condolences and sympathies and uh, I went on in sat down and uh, they passed the food out and uh, when the time came when the food was finished and the time came for the, the people to depart. Well, everybody got in line, and they come along and shook hands with the family. And Mr. Jack Pratt, who was in charge of the proceedings, uh, got up and uh, said that uh, uh, said whatever he was supposed to have said. 
uh, there was a noise going on and I didn't really get to hear what he said uh, I can only imagine uh, what uh, if he said what he was supposed to have said I can only imagine what uh, he did say I would imagine that he said that uh, the Piotr group uh, was uh, honored to have put food in these mourners mouth and to wipe away the tears and that they must look forward and uh, not keep these sorrows in their hearts because where life begins that's where this disease was at now and that this food that they took was symbolic of life and that uh, they were they wanted to hear the people the mourners to say to get up and go on with tribal businesses and dances and uh, hear the children uh, laughter and clamor about so that uh, the older people could sing and uh, that they could hear the the older people talking to the younger ones which would uh, be past uh, words and uh, thoughts that uh, are good for younger people to hear. Uh, that's what I would imagine that he said. <clears throat> and uh, right there is being a member of the family and being head chief of my band, I felt that I should right there say words to the people <clears throat> in my native tongue. but. Uh, there were so many people talking, wanting to talk, that I just withheld. And as Jack come through the line, shaking hands with the people, with the more with the mourning family, when he got to the end there and shook my hand, well, I put five dollars in his hand, and I says, Jack, father. In ending way, he's my father. I says, uh, this $5 I want to give you, and uh, perhaps you can feed yourself and your wife and your children or grandchildren. Uh, I said, you know the symbolism. I said, then I hope that you and your wife wake up to many happy mornings, and I hope you and your wife go to sleep and retire on many more happy occasions. And I hope that you and your wife see each other well and happy for a long time. In ending, it went something like this. There were head at this. It went to school talk at school park. It did two talk at this. It did a good at its car at the walk. Peter Tiri wear a suit or Uncle watch a suit, tea da da. Head it it's called Tita Kuratkuag. A test it a good a kit a kusara. Sweet tea suit, teddy good tea such a sar. The Kuraki. It he hair root a who. A test it a good a kit a good all good all. Rama. Then I looked over and I saw Jimmy's little girl, the deceased little girl, 12 years old. And I walked over there and I said, uh, I called her and she was sitting with her grandmother and her mother. And I said, I want you to know me. I am Garland Blaine. I am a close relative of yours. Whenever you see me, I want you to come and let me know that you are about. Shake my hand, call me, by relation name, I says, and uh, I will feel proud. I says, because uh, since growing children or growing young people change so much, in two years, if I saw you, I may not recognize you. And since the older people, the adult people, do not change as rapidly, I w you will probably know me every time you see me. So whenever you see me, you come up to me and you talk to me. I says, it will make me feel very good. 
and I told her that uh, to always listen to her father, I mean, uh, to always listen to her mother, grandmother, and grandfather, and to try to get all the good words that is passed on to her. And I says, you must remember that uh, to try to go to school and try to learn the way of life in these days. And I said that uh, for one thing that I wish she could do and listen to me is whenever she, if, if the things that she does that are good things, people will talk about them. The things that she does that she thinks are good things and the people do not think they're good, it will be only her that will be talking about them. I said, so face everything squarely and above all, be honest with yourself. Whenever you think of doing something that you're going to undertake, if there is a little doubt in your mind, it might be best to talk it over with somebody. Otherwise, uh, make up your mind and whatever you decide to undertake, well, get at it, get a handful of it, and just keep on and keep on until you either master it or, or being, be satisfied with yourself in your mind of whatever you decide to try and do. Her grandmother said that she was very thankful that I took time to talk to a little girl. And I says, that is my obligation. I wish that I could talk to all the younger people, and I wish that all the young people that I talked to would give me the kind attention that this little girl did. January the 16th, 1965. January the 16th, 1965. This is a broadcast from Norman, station WNAD, the Indian Hour. A regular Saturday morning broadcast of Indians for Indians. And here is your host for today's show, Voice Timmons. Good morning. That is, if you thought out, it's awfully cold this morning. I thought it was nice and warm. I saw the sun shining and got out without a heavy coat on there, froze to death. Be kind of cold in an open air teepee this morning. We've got some announcements, and we have Mr. Garland Blaine's going to sing some songs this morning. And uh, I want to make one or two statements here. And as you people probably are guessing, it's going to be a little bit about these adult centers we've got around over the state. They. Uh, Oklahoma Employment Commission didn't think there was anybody around up in the Watonga area that uh, was interested in going to school and working, but they found out Thursday. They wanted to start a little class up there for 15 people to teach them to be.
be farm mechanics. So they said, come in and sign up Thursday. And they had 83 people show up to sign up. They had to carry it over another day. And those people that didn't get on the roll for the class, the uh, Security, Oklahoma Employment Security Commission is working on a possibility of another class and uh, maybe uh, either there or at other places in the area. So this is just the beginning. And I think you've proved to the ones that are concerned that you're interested in helping yourselves and you're interested in work and some training. So this is real encouraging that the people up there showed this interest. And, uh, of course, the people that are working with the adult centers appreciate it. And I know that the Mr. Charles Pinoy felt real happy about it because he felt all along that the Indians up there were concerned about their economic situation. And uh, I think this proved a point for all of us. You people that didn't get on, just uh, hold on a little while and see if we can work something else out. And uh, for your information, at the last uh, Indian Center meeting at Lawton, they had 106 people. Honk City last week, they had 57. At Watonga last week, they had over 40. So the Indians are on the move here in the state, and I think you all ought to move together. It looks like they are, are about to move together. And we hope maybe this spring here at the university, this is in the planning stage, but you can be thinking about it. We like to have an all-state Indian meeting here at the university to plan and work on an Indian policy for the state of Oklahoma. And uh, we're hoping if we have it to have four to 500 Indians here. We've, there's been a lot of interest indicated in this, and we'll uh, give you information about it later on. And uh, saw lots of old friends. Some of these centers, it's always a pleasure to go around and meet these people. I was happy to see my good friend Dave Williams last week friend he brought with him to the meeting up around Canton Way. Uh, before we uh, start our announcements, we have a little special announcement here that we'd like to make. This is an invitation from Oscar Humphreys at the Cheyenne Indian Village to all Indians in the Cheyenne and Arapaho area to visit with him at his store in Watonga concerning any Indian handicraft they wish to sell. He is trying to establish a market for the Indian and is interested in buying their products. He will give honest and fair treatment. The Cheyenne Indian Village is located one block east and one block north of the Watonga Four Corners. Speaking of uh, Indian arts and crafts, you people are interested in an exhibit at the State Fair in Oklahoma City next week. We're trying to arrange to get an Indian area just for Indian things right to the, Oklahoma, the State Fair of Oklahoma City and uh, tell them that you're interested as an Indian to see that this is done. Kind of gives a little backing on it. Now the announcements. The Air Capital Club at Wichita is going to have a live program here on February the 6th. And they're going to have a program to publicize their dance to be held at February the 13th at the West Armory at 3535 West Douglas in Wichita, Kansas. Supper will be served at 5 o'clock. Bring your chairs and dishes. Walter King will be the head dancer and Louis Fawfall will be the head singer sent in by Miss Lena Squirrel. And uh, the Capital City Indian Club in Oklahoma City is sponsoring a Valentine dance on Saturday, February the 13th. And the place and the details of this will be announced at a later date. The Cheyenne and Rappo Pow Wow Club will sponsor a dance on February the 6th at El Reno Educational Building. Supper will be served at 6 p.m. Bring your dishes. Everybody welcome, especially all the war dancers. Please be on time and by Jim Warden, Canton, Oklahoma. The Wichita Intertribal Club will have a dance Saturday night, January the 23rd at the Army, Army Reserve Armory, 3130 George Washington Boulevard, Wichita, Kansas. Supper at 5.30, dance start at 7.30. Head woman dancers, Octa Mitchell, Omaha Indian from Macy, Nebraska. Head drummer, Jim Warden, a rapper Indian from Canton. They're giving a special invitation to everyone that... Uh, come out. And uh, this was sent in by uh, Paula Stabler, president. Now we've got even some listeners up in Chicago and friends up there that's going to have a powwow in Chicago, Illinois, the big windy city. On January the 23rd at Wellington Congressional Church, Wellington, just west off of Broadway, for the benefit of the American Indian Center. They're going to have dancing from 2 o'clock on till midnight. They're served at 5 p.m. So uh, this, this thing's going every place. It's kind of encouraging. The Oklahoma City Indians and El Reno Indians are invited to a hand game and a birthday party for Mike Toity to be 
held at Wiley Post Park on Friday, January the 22nd. I guess that's next Friday at 6.30 p.m. A son of Mr. and Mrs. Joe Toyde, especially inviting the Oklahoma City Powwow Club and the Capital City Indian Club and all the pro hand gamer players of the Cheyenne or Apple tribe. And the few I've seen, I think I'd call them professionals. They're really good at that stuff. Here's one from the Oklahoma Indian Council in Oklahoma City will be moving to a new home for their activities at 1208 Northeast 15th on Thursday, January the 21st. They're going to have an open house from 5 o'clock on and inviting everybody to come out and bring your chairs and dishes and a sack lunch as cooking facilities will be installed during that time. Now that's uh, in Oklahoma City, 1208 Northeast 15th on Thursday, January the 21st. This is an important move for those people up there and I think they'll be a a lot of interest and help the Indians in the Oklahoma City area. The Oklahoma Inner Tribal Club will sponsor a dance in the community building at Apache, Oklahoma, on the night of January the 23rd. Boy, if we make all these on the 23rd, we're going to go from Chicago to El Reno and everywhere. This is at the Apache Community Building, January the 23rd, starting at 7 p.m. It's in honor of Tom Littlechief, who is retired from the Lawton Fire Department after 20 years of service. The Kyle Gord Clan dance will dance clan will dance in the afternoon. First part of the program, and Taft Hank, the president, requests all the Gord clan dancers and singers to make every effort to attend. Ralph Cote will be the head singer, and the head dancer will be announced later. The uh, Oklahoma Inter Tribal Club will have a club meeting at the home of James Chestnut on the night of January the 18th. President James Chestnut urges all members to attend this meeting. Here's our last announcement. There'll be a benefit hand game to be held at uh, Iowa Hall here at Perkins, Saturday, January the 16th. That's today, isn't it? Or was that yesterday? Today, isn't it? Supper will be at 5.30 p.m. Bring your dishes. This will be to help our committee on their trip to Washington. I also want to thank the many Iowa people who took an interest in the Iowa Tribes meeting on January the 9th. This is Mrs. Nelson White. And I might announce, too, that Squaw Indian Club here is planning a state tournament, a hand game tournament here just as soon as they can get organized in the second semester. You know, we had a small one last year, and everybody liked it so much they wanted the club to do it again. So uh, keep your guessing abilities sharp, and we'll announce it as soon as we can get settled in the next semester. Now, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Mr. Garland Blaine, who will make an announcement and give us some music. Well, uh, first I will sing a song, a warrior song, of the Pawnees, then I'll make my announcement. <clears throat>
having a war dance here on, at Oklahoma City on the 23rd of December. The, it will be at this uh, colored school on Witcher Road, about a mile south of the Indian Hills Park. Uh, everybody knows this place as uh, Oto Hall. And uh, the head singer will be Albert Waters, a Ponca from Ponca City. And it will be a closed drum due to the fact that uh, I know there's a lot of singers and I know that you would want to come and help. And, uh, but space-wise, uh, there'll be a lot of dancers and uh, we want to try to conserve the space for the dancers. And I would like to have all the singers, and perhaps another time we will, we will do that. The head straight dancer will be Pete Moore, a Pawnee Oto from Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> then we will have two <coughs> head dancers. The head dancer for the Feather dancers or fancy dancers will be Nick Webster. You all know Nick Webster. He's uh, been a champion over and over. He's the chairman of the Tulsa Powwow Club. He's an Arapaho from Tulsa, Oklahoma. <coughs> the head woman dancer will be Emma Jean Maker. I, she's an Osage from Harmony, Oklahoma. I refer to her as Emma Jean Maker. I don't know what her married name is. Supper will be at 5.30, and the dance will start at 7 o'clock, approximately. Bring your own dishes and chairs. And I welcome one and all to come and have a good time with us. Now I'll sing some another type of song. <clears throat> of the song is that in the early days when the warriors got up and scotted around early in the morning, they would feel 
real happy and glad when they were out on at their post, at their watch, scouting, scouting for game, or for, in another sense of the word, uh, scouting to see uh, if, if there were any enemy in the vicinity whereby they could uh, send a warning. It was always a good feeling for the warrior to be way out, away by himself from any help. When the sun would come up and uh, real bright and shiny where they could have the full use of their vision. And in this day and age, you hear the term, the sun is smiling down on us. Well, that's what this song was, uh, in one sense of the word, that's what this song is, uh, has a reference to. I'll sing uh, a war dance song. <laughs> adulthood, all the training that he has had to 
compare, observe, and with his help and guidance by God, he becomes a great warrior and a great hunter. And during that time, he has seen many things, death, face death, and has been in extreme cold and hot weather. And during that time, he may have seen something where he was by himself, where he was learning how to think. The second song is in later life, after he has abandoned the life of a great hunter and a great warrior, and uh, he is now up in age, and uh, he m uh, may have had a vision when he was younger. Now he has pursued it, and he may be a doctor now. And this second song is symbolic of the man's life after he he has seen the later life in his later years. That is why the first part, the first part of the song says, "I imitate the horse." which the horse belongs. To imitate the horse means that he, the horse is a great boy, and that's what he wants to be. Uh, which the horse belongs means that he belongs to this organization called the Young Horse Dance or Young Dog Dance. Second song says, I am belong, I'm belonging from whence the horse is from, which is that in later life he is getting towards the, the evening of his lifetime, and that he will soon pass on. And that's what he is referring to, where he says, I am lonely, getting lonely for the place from whence the horse comes, meaning heaven. If you have any announcements to be made, send them in to Boyd Tennant's WNAD station, Norman, Oklahoma. And once again, a reminder of all the powers on January the 23rd, the Oklahoma Inter-Tribal Club will have theirs at the community building at Apache on the night of the 23rd at 7 p.m. And also a reminder of the power in Chicago. Maybe most of you can make it. A word now to all Indians. This day is Saturday, the 13th of February, 1965. This is Garland Blaine. I am going to tell a Pawnee fairy tale. Once upon a time, there was a wolf. And he was real bad. He was very cunning. He liked to lie. He uh, cheated. And, uh, oh, he was one of those bad boys. So, uh, he was so bad that uh, the people finally got so tired of him that they... Uh, told him that uh, he was no more of the uh, he was unknown to anybody they declared that uh, anytime he went to anybody to talk to, to them that they would not talk to him he was outcast he just uh, he was a nobody nobody paid any attention to him he'd go up and try to talk to somebody and they just just like there was nobody there he was ignored completely he uh, hung around the village there where the rest of them lived, and uh, he was just completely ignored. Uh, he had to hustle around and try to get something to eat. He couldn't go to anybody's dwelling and uh, ask them for any food, because as far as the, uh, others were concerned, well, he, was, he just didn't exist. And this was very bad. He finally... Uh, felt so alone and uh, left out of everything that he finally went off and he hung around close to the village there. So one day, well, uh, he went over to hill there and he was up on top of the hill there looking around. And he looked down along the creek there and he saw a lot of turkeys down there. So he thought, I think I'll go down there and see what I could do to get something to eat. I might kill me a good turkey and eat him. So he went down and uh, he thought, oh, there's a lot of young, big, fat turkeys there. Now how am I going to get one to eat? 
So he thought, and he says, well, now, if I go up there and try to talk to them, they're going to ignore me. Well, I'll see, he thought to himself. So he strolled down the hill, went over to the edge of the trees, forest, and along the river bank there, and he walked up to them. And he said, uh, uh, hello, children. They all looked at him, and one of them says, that's that bad wolf. Now, we don't want to talk to him. They told us, our fathers and mothers told us, do not talk to him, no matter what he says. As far as, the, as, far as everybody's concerned, he just isn't here anymore. He kept trying to talk to them, and they would ignore him. They didn't have nothing to say to him, and they just, uh, he'd walk up to one of them and stand right in front of them and try to talk to them, and they wouldn't talk to him. So finally he left them. He couldn't get none of them off by them by themselves. So he finally went back over to the hilltop and got up on the hilltop there, and he laid down. The next morning he got up, and he was real hungry. Very, very hungry. So he come down the hill again, went down to the creek, and he washed his face and waded around a little bit, you know, and he got all cleaned up. And here come the young turkeys again. So he went over then and he he made uh, he made out with his movements like he was carrying a something real heavy uh, on his back and he was staggering a little bit and he had his arm, hands up over to, uh, to his shoulder and then he'd stagger a little bit and then he'd make believe and act like he took a heavy load off and put it on the ground. Then he'd wipe his brow, take a few deep breaths and then he'd reach down and gra make like he was catching a hold of something and he'd hoist it back up on his shoulder and he'd stagger some more. And these turkeys got to looking at him and say, what's that guy doing? It's like he's carrying something, but he isn't carrying anything. But it sure does. He, it just looks like he's carrying something. So he kind of looked behind him a little bit, you know. He had his back to them and he kind of turned a little bit and looked and he saw that they were watching well. That was what he was wanting, you know. So he walked over a little bit and sat down. So the, one of the turkeys come on up and he said, uh, Wolf, he said, what, uh, are you carrying something? I don't see anything, but are you carrying something? He said, uh, you say, uh, the wolf says, uh, turkey, you say that you, don't, you do not see what I'm carrying? Turkey says, no, I don't. He says, tell the rest of them to come up here. So old Turkey turned around, and he gobbled, you know, and here come the rest of them. And he said, um, he st the wolf stood up, and he said, let me ask you something, turkeys. Do you see this bag that I have here? They all said no. So one little bit of turkey, he says, I see it. He says, now, there's the only one in the bunch of you that appreciates uh, things, that has imagination. And the rest of you, I I'm surprised. But now, now, don't let me keep you. Now, you all leave. Don't let me keep you because uh, I'm an outcast. Now, if your folks see me, see you talking to me, well, they're going to get mad at me and they might stone me or they might uh, hurt me. He says, no, nah, I'm hurt enough. I don't want you, I don't want uh, you people to feel that uh, you, uh, if I get hurt, I don't want you to feel that you have anything to do with it. So uh, you all leave now, you all leave. So one of them says, well, all right, but I sure wished I was like this, that little boy there. I sure wish that I could see something there. So he said, well, he says, maybe you will, maybe you will. So he picked up the bag again and made believe like he hoisted up on his shoulder and he walked over a little ways and he stopped. He never got out of sight. They were all standing there looking at him and he put this big bag down, you know, and he acted like he untied it and he acted like he 
put his hand way down in there and he'd pull something out and he'd look at it and then he'd put it back in the bag. And he'd pull something else out, you know. He'd look at it and he'd put, put it back in the bag. Pretty soon he pulled something out and he looked at it and he peeled his the pearls back, you know, and he gave a big old smile and he shook his, uh, nodded his head in approval, you know, and he says, this is what I've been looking for. And here come the turkeys. They come running up there and says, what is it you're looking for? What is it you have in your hand? We do not see anything. He said, oh, yes. Yes, sir. He said, um, there's, there's beautiful song in this bag. Beautiful song. But, now, you turkeys, you like to dance, but you're not old enough yet to appreciate such things, so that's why you can't, you can't even see the bag, let alone the song. So this other turkey said, uh, well, uh, let me hear one of them. So he says, oh, no, I, I can't do that. He says, now, he said, you all leave now. He says, leave me to myself. He says, I want to sing these songs. So... They all left. It was getting towards evening. So they, the turkeys all left and went back to their homes. And the wolf then got around that night, and he rushed around, and he found a few skins scattered here and there, and he finally improvised a bag. So the next day, he uh, put young saplings in there and bulged the bag out. So the next morning, he, the turkeys were all out there playing around, you know, and here he come with a bag. And one of them says, look at the wolf. I see that bag. I must be getting to a place where I can appreciate things. I must be growing up. I must be getting to a place where, like he said, or that I wasn't yesterday. And I, I, feel, I, I feel real good about this. I'm going to run up there and tell him that I see the bag today. So the rest of them thought the same thing. So they all run up there, see. Uh, they all run up there and says, uh, wolf. We see that bag today. We couldn't see it yesterday, but today we see it. Can we see the song? And Wolf looked at him and he said, Why, you know, this is touching. I really feel good. It feels like that I've brought you into something. I've showed something to you. Can you really see this bag? Are you kidding me? Fooling me? You just were saying this to feel, make me feel good? He says, No, we, what we're saying is true. We can see the bag. He says, well, that sure is good. He says, now, stand right where you are. Now, I'm going to pull one of these songs out and let you look at it. So he reached in his bag, and he, of course, there was nothing in the bag. But he made out like he picked out something, and he held it up. And he said, isn't that beautiful? And one of them says, I don't see anything. The other one says, I don't see anything either. He says, well, don't uh, feel bad. You do see the bag, though. They said, yes says, well, don't feel, a, don't feel bad, uh, too badly if you can't see the song, because uh, you can't learn up to appreciate things overnight. You just, it, it, it'll come to you. And as it comes to you, you get to seeing more and more, and you're growing into adulthood. So, oh, they were thankful. So, uh, the next day then, uh, he come back by with that bag, and he said, uh, they all ran up there and talked to him. And he said, well, he says, uh, I do feel sorry for you if you can't see these songs. But now, <clears throat> I'm going to sing one for you and uh, see if you can hear it. Maybe it may, be, it may be that you can't hear it. Even you hear me talking right now, but maybe you can't hear the song. So he said, all right. He says, now, I want you, uh, when I start singing, and if you can hear it, well, I want you to start dancing. So this, uh, they said, all right, Mr. Wolf, uh, go ahead and sing. So he started singing, and this song says, come right by me here, come towards me. Uh, he was telling him this. He says, come towards me and walk right close to me and learn how to appreciate these songs. Close your eyes and put your head way down and shake your tail feathers. So this song, the one he, that's what he was telling him to do, and he says, "Now just brush me, brush right by me as you pass by." 
and uh, don't be afraid to step on my foot because you're not going to hurt me and, and uh, this will really give us a good feeling a good feeling of fellowship and uh, a good feeling of uh, trust and uh, you can uh, I want you to dance so uh, the, uh, the words in this song says here they come They've duck, they, they are dipping their heads low <coughs> and they are shaking their tail feathers and here's the way the song goes that was the song that he was singing and the turkeys oh boy they start stomping their feet and they put their heads way down close their eyes and they just walk right dance right by him you know and their tail feathers would just spread out and their wings would drag the ground and then they'd gobble and then they'd shake their tail feathers and so he picked out the biggest one when that big fellow come by him, boy, he grabbed him around the neck and he conked him on the head and stuck him in the bag. That was his dinner. So in a little while, he stopped. They all stopped. And he said, how did you like that song? They says, uh, well, boy, can we dance some more? He says, no, no. He said, uh, he said I just don't want to rush you into this. He said, so. He said, I'll pick up my bag now and I'll leave. He says, and uh, wait, look for me tomorrow. So he picked up the bag with a turkey in there, took him over the hill and plucked him and built a big fire and he roasted him and he ate him. That was his dinner. So he thought, well now, I can do this every day. Well, just like all other things, you overdo things. <laughs> you overdo good things. So the next day, he killed two. <coughs> And the uh, same thing happened. He sang the song, and he, uh, this time he killed uh, two, and he ate them. And the next day he come down, and he sang the song again, and, and oh man, he had they told one another that uh, the wolf was had beautiful songs, a whole bag full of songs, and that he was singing them and uh, they could dance. So this next, uh, they, by that time they began to say, say, there's some of us are missing. Uh, one of them says, uh, my, my sister isn't here today. One says, uh, well, my brother hasn't been here since the day before yesterday. And uh, they started uh, saying that uh, they didn't know where they were. They looked all through the village and they couldn't find find them. And finally, uh, one of them says, "You know," says when that wolf was singing, he said, uh, "Seemed like somebody almost grabbed me around the neck and then turned me loose." He says, "Of course, I had my eyes closed and I was really dancing." He says, "And I didn't pay much attention." He says, "But you know, I was dancing right by." A great big old boy. And boy, it seemed like he was just whisked away. And uh, somebody said, well, say, you know that bag? I saw it kind of moving. Just like somebody trying to get out of there. So somebody says, say, you don't suppose that, uh, you don't suppose that he's, uh, puts them in there and takes them away, do you? Takes us away. So one of them says, well, we better watch him today. So they all went down there, and he, he come with his bag of songs. And he says, well, are you all ready? Yes, sir, we're ready. So they all, he started singing, and they started dancing. Pretty soon, well, he, by the time he grabbed hold of one of them, knocked him in the head, well, the rest of them jumped on him. And they stomped him, and he got up, and he started running. Of course, he'd eaten all this rich food, 
and as he started running, well, they were kicking him, uh, throwing rocks at him, <coughs> throwing stones at him, and they run him, and they run him, and then he started uh, uh, getting tired and uh, uh, being, uh, uh, his body being abused and exposed to uh, uh, kickings and uh, hitting with the rocks and sticks, well, and had he had eaten all this rich food, well, first thing you know, well, he started getting tired, and as a result, well, uh, his stomach became upset, and his bowels became loose, and uh, there was just a trail of droppings where he was running, and that he became weak, and pretty soon he fell down, and uh, here come the, the mob of the turkeys. And they jumped on him and uh, stomped him in the ground and uh, killed him. So the, the old men, whenever they would tell the story, they'd say, well, now, that is why uh, if you're walking along the countryside, well, you'll find a, a kind of a marshy place where the ground is uh, a white, grayish clay. Well, that's where this wolf was probably done in, right there. And then they would say, now, see, you young people, now, do not let your curiosity get the best of you. Whenever you don't know anything, don't ask a stranger about it. Go to your father and mother. They will tell you. Anything that you want to know, your father and mother will tell you. Uh, do not uh, uh, go to a stranger and uh, ask him things. And if somebody tells you something, but you really do not uh, see, uh, understand, uh, right there is where you want to stop and say, well, now, this, this doesn't quite make sense. And if something just doesn't quite make sense to you, well, don't go any further. Turn around right there. Uh, these uh, old men used to come along with uh, advice like that from stories. The old men would say, do not let people put words in your mouth and make you admit something that you know isn't true. And they always said, the best thing to do is to tell the truth. They always said, if something has a certain appearance, make sure that it's really that way. Because all these things that is in the story, these things, if you are foolish and do these things, your life may depend on it one of these days. And if you are like the turkeys, If you're naive like the turkey as well, you'll, if your life depends on it, well, you'll lose it. To continue with another story, I shall tell a story of a little snake, uh, which brings to my mind when I was a child growing up, we would always, uh, uh, some of the Indians would gather at some places, uh, perhaps uh, to discuss business, and uh, to keep the children quiet and running in and out of the doors and disturbing the elders, well, they, some old man would uh, volunteer to take the children out on the porch or under the arbor or in another room according to the time of the year. And there we would uh, be entertained by an old man telling these uh, Tskirihki stories. Tskirihki means uh, wolf. Uh, I turned these stories as uh, fairy tales. Uh, however, they are basically fables. So if I, if I refer to them as uh, fairy tales, well, 
basically they are fables so uh, this you might keep this in mind now this little story of this uh, snake there was a den of snakes and they were rattlesnakes and the father snake had many rattles mother snake had uh, a lot of rattles and uh, these uh, rattlers that these uh, brothers and sisters had well they uh, they took great pride in uh, making the rattling noise with them then the the baby uh, snake well it didn't have a rattle and every day it'd say it'd get out there with their brothers and sisters and it would try to rattle too and it wouldn't just wouldn't make any noise so the uh, father and mother would say, be patient, and uh, it won't be long, well, you'll have a rattle, a rattler, and although it'd get out there, and it uh, said it wanted one, and it'd, it'd, get out, it'd get out there with the brothers and sisters, and uh, anything that caused them to make this rattling noise well then the little baby one well it would try to make the rattling noise and uh, it just wouldn't make anything and uh, it would pout around once in a while as the other children do so one day well he went out and he saw a whole lot of people uh, trekking along and he ran out there and he tried to make the noise and uh, no 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 noise came and everybody ignored him and almost stepped on him and he finally had to get out of the road so he ran down and he told his big brother and his big big brother went out there and he looked and he saw the people and he says uh, big brother he says make that noise make that rattling noise the big brother says wow these people are they're not bothering us they we we don't have to getting mad at them or anything he says well I just want to hear that noise so big brother raised his tail up and he curled up and boy he let this old rattler go you know he had several rattlers and uh, the people looked and they give him room they all cleared you know and went around him and so they run back and went back in the hole and he says uh, Papa he says I got to have one of them things Mama, he says, I got to have one. Boy, and then he started crying. I mean, he just really went berserk. He just laid on the floor and he uh, wiggled his uh, tail. Had he had legs to kick with, I guess he'd have done that. But he just wiggled his tail and he <laughs> rolled over and he curled up and then he'd <laughs> try to stand up and he'd fall and hit his head against the ground. And he was just really raising all kinds of cane. So uh, during this uh, 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 crying tantrum, uh, he says, uh, "He said, uh, am I so odd that I do not have a rattle to rattle?'" Uh, that's the name. Of, that's the words in this song, and. Uh, the song, uh, the way the tune goes, indicates that he is crying. And when I sing this song, well, you might uh, think about that. It goes like this. Kara kara te pira wa ki ro re Te kara re ku ki re ro re Ro re Ro re The words in this song as I have said are Kara kara te pira wa ki means Am I the only one that is so odd that I do not have anything to shake. So um, they say uh, the reason why this, uh, they say that if a child 
uh, goes to crying, it'll cry with a certain amount of strain. And then uh, as it, uh, if it feels badly and just keeps crying and wants to cry, then after a while the uh, crying becomes uh, less forceful, but then uh, they won't stop. And then it'll uh, it'll uh, uh, be a kind of a sad, mournful wailing. Well, the tune of this song tried tried to uh, get uh, tried to get that uh, in a way that uh, it it to make it uh, sound that way. So uh, the father and mother. Then got together and they uh, made strong medicine. And they brought the little boy in and the brothers and sisters and they all sat down and and uh, through efforts uh, of uh, trying to acquire something that uh, isn't uh, to be had yet, uh, they. Uh, uh, set the boy down and uh, they thought and they uh, meditated and uh, they wished and uh, uh, they put their mind into unison and finally uh, the little boy uh, 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 all at once well there he was with a rattle so oh he was happy and I'm telling you, he just rattled that thing all night long. The rest of them couldn't sleep. And he just rattled and rattled and rattled, and then he'd jump up and he'd run outside and he'd rattle a little bit, and they'd run out after him and bring him back and set him down. And he just, all the next day, he rattled and rattled and rattled. Everywhere he'd go, he just, just continued to rattle. So and they told him, now, listen, uh, it's not good to do them things. Uh, you'll get into trouble. You're not supposed to rattle only when you're in danger. And uh, you're, you're not in danger. He says, well, he said, uh, I'm not in danger. He said, I'm, I'm having a good time. He said, this, I want to rattle. So they tell him, all right, but be careful. So here come another uh, tribe of Indians uh, on a hunt, and they come uh, journeying down through close to this snake den, and uh, the father come running in and he said there's some more people coming by so everybody stay in and uh, this little boy he jumped up and he ran outside and I tell you he ran out there and he ran right over to the middle of the uh, where the people were uh, marching <coughs> and he curled up and he stuck up that little tail and he started rattling and Mother said, uh, where's the, the little boy? And they says, well, he was here just now. Says, I'll bet he went out there. So they all run out there, and the people were going by. So they all stopped until the last one went by, and then they run out there and tried to find him. There he was. His head was staked to the ground. He had gotten into trouble like they told him. So the old people used to say, now, something that you do not have wait till you atone it and then you can then you'll be smart enough to know what to do with it 